All right. Um, so what keywords do you associate with software quality? What is software quality? How would you measure it? Yeah? Maintainability. Maintainability, yeah? So let's have... Maintainability, what else? Reliability. What else? Is stability a, a good thing, or is it more about reliability? Maybe it's more reliable. Yeah. Yeah. Like logic, how logic we construct the applications or uh, code bases. So uh, correct usage of patterns and easy to. Yeah. Be so yeah, that that's true. Uh, so okay, let's put. Stability question mark and so you're mentioning use of patterns. Um, yeah, like say proper coding practices, right? Yeah. Um, so they kind of contribute to some of those already, right? Yeah. So they, they contribute to maintainability. Let's say it's easy to, to read to understand that. Like yeah, so the, exactly. So that's. Read ability that also contributes to that, right? Mm -hmm. So those are kind of good ones. Um, and they contribute to some of those. Um, stability. Which, well, um, so let's say rigid, rigid, rigidity. <laughs> Is a quality of a software that makes it hard to change a good thing or bad thing? It could be both. It could be both. I mean, like, it could add a massive amount of technical depth if it's really stable, but it's really poorly written. Yeah. So, yeah. Because so, if you change one component, the whole application fails, it should be like that. Yeah, so this typically is a kind of a negative thing, right? Um, you don't want, uh, if you need to introduce a change and it's really hard to make a change, that most of the time is a bad thing. Uh, so kind of the opposite of that is that if you need to introduce the change, the change is kind of localized and only influences the things it influences and everything else kind of stays unchanged, right? So if the structure allows you to easily change or evolve some feature, without influencing everything else. That's good, and that's why we use object-oriented designs, and that's why we try to do architectures which separate certain bits of the system from others. So then if we need to introduce a change, the change doesn't influence everything. It influences only a subset of the system, right? Uh, so kind of being able to modify and extend or mo change um, relatively easily is a kind of a, is a positive thing, right? So this one and, and this okay, one. Maybe not stability, maybe robustness. Yeah. Yeah, we could say that. Right. So that kind of says, yeah, the, the software is robust. We can introduce change and it kind of, it's easy to do, right? Uh, yeah. Consistency uh, regarding syntax and formatting. Yeah, so consistency, I would say. So those. Um, those here are like tactics to achieve some strategies, right? Those are kind of a bigger, uh, wide, wider kind of concepts which we want, and those are uh, ways to get there, right? Um, so what else? What else is kind of a bigger, useful to have? Efficiency. Efficiency. Yes. So start. Yeah, let me just write efficiency. Yeah, stability is kind of good. Where where stability is good? 
What do you don't want to be changing in your system? Ever. Hopefully. Or? Yeah? But what exactly? That depends on the software. If we are... So stability of the interfaces. Interfaces or APIs, right? Once you dis define how the two modules communicate, what is the interface between them, you don't really want to change that. You can extend it, but you don't want to change the meaning of what it means, the, the individual method calls or the contract with, where you, which you have between the modules, right? So, so well-designed kind of APIs and interfaces are kind of fundamental, right? And Go goes into extreme because most Go interfaces are just one method. <laughs> Right? So like, okay. <laughs> and then you make more complex things by composing those single method interfaces, right? Uh, in Java, for example, you have interfaces which are multiple methods, right? Uh, and then over time, it shows up that we really need some change, right? And what happens then? What happens if, you know, you do need a change in the interface which has 10 methods? It influences, you know, everything in your system. So a single change in the contract kind of influences everything. Uh, so I'm not like, you did Java, right? Uh, all of you. So some containers have certain interfaces and sometimes getting a size of the container is, you know, different to the other interface that another container has. So a list and a an, uh, generic container, they have slightly different interfaces because it's kind of inconsistent, right? Um, so if if they were composed out of much simpler interfaces, then it would be sort of easier to maintain it because it would it would have been obvious that the list interface for some uh, ordering purposes would have to reuse something else that already exists and is used by other, right? Um, yeah, you wanted to say? Uh, no. It's an additional note on Go that you don't have, you don't implement interfaces in the sense you do. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's implicit, right? You don't explicitly say it. It's it's sort of derived from the usage, which also makes it much easier to reuse them and to use them. Um, right. So we do have some tactics uh, which are which we use, and we do have some um, some uh, metrics which we have to um, uh, yeah so we have some of them here so we have correctness um, as the first one and that means that you know the system actually does what the user wanted the system to do right um, we have usability that it's uh, easy to use. We haven't had those two. We had this one. So it's, you know, uh, maintainability that it's readable, that it's easy to locate problems and it's easy to fix them. Um, we discussed that uh, in, the, in the context of robustness, that it's sort of uh, relatively easy to uh, expand it. Um, and to modify the system, is, the, the system can deal with that. Um, then we set uh, efficiency, which here is called performance. It's the same thing, right? Um, performance is not always necessary, right? Uh, we don't need the highest performance ever. We just need a satisfying performance, right? Even if you're doing games, uh, if something renders 90 frames per second or 60 frames per second, we say that's fine. That's all we need. We don't need 120 if we are going to play on a, a PlayStation which has 90 or on a screen that has 90, right? If we go for VR system and we have to have 120, we go, okay, we do 120, but we don't need 240, right? We optimize it to the level that satisfies the requirements, right? Uh, very rarely we optimize to the fullest possible physically achievable level, right? Uh, with games, given the, uh, the complexity of the physics and so on, sometimes we do that. Like we, 
even though we don't push the frame rate above the one that is required, we push the number of um, elements that we have, the triangles that we have to render, right? Uh, we all we kind of go to the limit, but uh, with the normal systems like the ones you are developing now, um, you know, human level responsiveness is all you need. You don't need to optimize, you know, to, to perfection. Um, testability is another one. So how easy is to test that the system is correct and has all those other features, right? How easy it is in, in your system at the moment? Um, reliability, uh, the ability of the system to perform uh, the functions for a duration of time, right? So how reliable the system is. Will it break? Will it break with the new Android release? Uh, will it break with the new Angular release? Uh, how how much it relies on the server backend, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, reusability, how different parts of the system can be reused, how modular it is. Can you take part of it and reuse it in another context? Um, so those are all elements that um, contribute to, to the system quality, right? So we have eight. Um, Which one is the most important? Correctness. Yeah, I, I would say so as well. I would say if, if everything else is satisfied but the user doesn't want it or doesn't need it, then what's the point, right? Um, so, Correctness is probably the the fundamental one, and then everything else kind of it depends. It depends on what the user really needs, right? Uh, if the user really need the performance, then performance is more um, important than flexibility, right? And so on. If you're doing a, a code for a space shuttle, maybe you will, don't want really modular system. I mean, it's only for that purpose, right? Uh, so you can trade off some, some of the other ones. But the correctness is important. So um, we have two terms. One is verification and one is validation. Uh, they kind of both apply to correctness, right? Um, so the difference is that verification checks if the product meets the spec, right? So that's what the verification is. And then validation is, is the spec meeting the requirements of the user, right? So what testing would you use for one or what testing would you use for the other? So what sort of uh, testing we, we discussed so far, right? We discussed uh, unit testing. We discuss integration testing. And we discuss end to end testing. What what's this one? Basic testing of the functionality of uh, classes, uh, functions. Yeah. Same time. That's right. So when you're developing code, you have some building blocks. Like if you're doing Android with Java, you have classes, you have methods. If you're doing Go, you have some basic structs and functions operating on the structs or functions operating on, on data. You have some interfaces. Uh, so the unit testing is basically testing the classes and the methods. In Go case, it's testing the functions, right? Uh, what's integration testing? Some some more blocks together and how they cooperate with each other in some maybe a chain of events sending the blocks to. Oh. That's right. So in the first case, we do testing in isolation of individual blocks of individual units that we have. Let's say a single function, or a single class, or a single method. And with integration testing, we see if the classes between each other or functions between each other. Co collaborate correctly. 
So we involve more parts of the system to test them, right? So we do similar things to unit testing, but include more things in a test. So we kind of see if the modules or units talk to each other correctly and work together, right? What's end-to-end -end testing? Well, it's basically, uh, say you have an entry point into your application, say it's your backend, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, start from like the first most out you can be mm -hmm. and into your logic. So you basically test that uh, or the communication with your logic. Correct. So so end-to-end -end tests are kind of a form of integration tests which involve a kind of a certain pathway from the front end, say to, you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, to the back end and back, right? So they test the functionality from one end to the, to the other end and <laughs> back again, right? Uh, that's why they call end-to-end, right? So we touch one edge of the system <coughs> and test all the way to the other edge and back. In a system like yours, it would be talking with, starting the test with the app, with the user side of things, all the way to the backend and back to the, to the user. In your case, it's the same. You have the HTML frontend navigating through all the different parts of the UI through the REST API to the database and back, right? and you test that this pathway back and forth works correctly. Um, so those three types of tests, they will be a verification or they will be a validation? Wh which category would you put them into? Verification. Verification. Verify. Okay, so if those three are verification, uh, how about validation? How do we do that? Yeah. User tests, set those tests. Good. User tests, acceptance tests. So, can you tell me more about those? Uh, what sort of frameworks can you use for your projects? We kind of discussed it before the lecture, but can you repeat it? Uh, it depends on the on which program uh, programming language you use. Yeah. Many tests are uh, traditionally uh, language based. So, for example, for Go, you'll use basically the Go tester. Yeah. Or for uh, Angular, you could use Karma as a server, and they use Jasmine as kind of the unit testing framework. Yeah. Uh, and for C, there are also a lot of uh, framework. You can use Catch for C++, for example. Yeah. So it depends. On integration tests, it also depends on uh, what the components you are testing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, also language specific end to end testing could be whatever, basically. It uh, depends on uh, what you're going to test. Mm -hmm. You could use just uh, HTTP server and test the endpoints without the front end, or you could use the front end framework to do end to end testing. Yeah, very good. So those, those are kind of language specific. For Java, you have JUnit. For Go, you have the built-in testing framework already in the tool, tool chain. Uh, you can use Karma and Jasmine for Angular and for other JavaScript type of uh, testing. Uh, for integration, you can be a little bit more flexible, uh, but you have to use something typically language specific as well. Uh, for end-to-end, -end, you're even more flexible because you're testing but much larger functionality. So there are frameworks to do this, uh, which you have to pick for your use case. So if you have kind of an Android use case, usually you start testing by the front-end and kind of uh, instantiate the, the rest of the app for your testing. So an Android has some toolkits for that. Um, so how about this, these ones? So this is a validate. So how would you do those? What sort of tools we can use for those? So you can use like a 
take your game or take your app, takes a bunch of users, you have some protocol, you specify what you need to test uh, beforehand, and then you specify how you're gonna get the answer, and then you prepare a form of an experiment, which you tell the users to do something, and then by observing them and collecting some data, you learn the answer to the question, right? So you can do user tests with users this way. Um, what else can you do? A-B testing. A-B testing, yeah. So it's a form of user tests. So you have two features or two different ways of doing something and you split the users into two groups and you let them, one of them do one way, they let the other one do the other way and then you compare or something similar. Um, so those are, those require uh, kind of a, some sort of protocol. They require some sort of upfront thinking of what is that you need an answer for, right? Um, how about acceptance tests? Yep. Uh, is it just meant to be between, for example, product owner? So you present your uh, understanding of uh, the product you're building and you have, like, uh, you discuss with the product owner for how, or to what degree you satisfy him and his understanding, or is it different? Yes, it, uh, part, of the, part of it is this, exactly. So part of the kind of acceptance testing is that there is some sort of contract between the product owner and the development team, and the product owner lists something. Currently, we use user stories. So we specify some user stories which we want to have as a product owner, and then the development team fulfills those user stories. So then demonstrates in the sprint saying, look, a user story number 23 is done and that's how it works, right? And then we make a tick, right? Uh, so by writing user stories uh, that me as a not logged in user can log into the system and so on, uh, I specify some preconditions, I specify some outcome uh, of the system working, uh, then we can have a contract and using Jira or using some sort of a management tool, we can track those things, right? And that is a way to communicate between the product owner and the development team. Usually, we validate uh, that the users will get what they want by doing additional things between the thing gets to the product owner, right? Uh, so if we have, uh, if this is the, the development team, this is the product owner, and this is the real world with the real users, right? Um, then the marketing team and some, uh, you know, user relationships team and so on, they work out what is the set of qualities that the users really need, and then the product owner translates them into user stories, which then the development team implements, right? Uh, so there is a bit of a buffering like the development team will not directly work with the, uh, with the users usually. Uh, they will work with the product owner and the user stories which the product owner specifies, right? Um, so, um, let's have a, a short cartoon. Have you seen this one? Yeah. It's pretty well known, um, of the communication problems, right? Between the users uh, and the marketing team, the product owner and the developers. They are interfaces between each of those and they end up colluding the message, right? So as we were saying, you have a user here, you have some marketing department, you have, I don't know, some other departments which the product owner re responds to. So he has his own bosses which he needs to respond to. Uh, there are some teams which work with the user 
and then you end up with having user stories and you as a development team kind of work with that and you try to satisfy this, right? And because of those problems which this cartoon captures, uh, we learned that doing it in this sort of a waterfall way is not efficient. So what we want, we want something that the users can directly uh, agree on. Uh, so then the interface is as direct as possible. So we want the user stories, which the user can read and understand and agree to, be the same, which become the spec for the team to actually work on, right? Uh, so we want those things to be kind of the same. Um, so the product owner still kind of manages the process, but the user stories, uh, they, uh, in user-readable language, in such a way that the user can read them and agree to them and say, yeah, that's, that's, that looks fine. That looks like a good thing, right? Uh, in the past, as I was saying, it went through some stages and then what the development teams were working was a kind of a technical specification of what needs to be developed. And the language of the technical specification was removed from the user way of de describing what the system should do. And that led to problems, right? So we are trying now to work with the text that is sort of a, a end user readable. What's the problem with that? What is the problem with that approach? Yeah, so the user may not know what they want and also they may not be able to express it in a um, uh, correct and um, consistent fashion, right? So they may have conflicting objectives or they may want something that they, you know, describe in a, in a wrong way and, and so on, right? So that's why the, the vagueness was before translated through those, those processes into the technical spec, which is very, you know, um, consistent, it's correct, doesn't have any contradictions in it, but it may not capture what the user wants, right? So we have to meet somewhere in the middle, right? So what we want is we want user stories which are from one hand readable to the user, but from the other hand consistent enough that the develop and development team can work with, right? Uh, so how we do that? Yeah, we don't have much about um, Yeah, that slide is not exactly what I was looking for, but it's sort of close enough, right? Um, so do you know any um, any frameworks or anything that fits into the acceptance testing kind of category, which works directly with user stories? No fidelity drawings of the front end, maybe? Showing how the dead people paint the, what the user wants? Yeah. That, that would be good, but it's uh, hard to automate the process. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, your slide, like um, a different version of test driven development, where you uh, specify the uh, expected behavior of the application in another way than code before you actually code it. Yes, exactly. So that's exactly what it is, right? Um, 
So what, what we kind of came up with so far uh, is that if you can describe what needs to be tested in a language that the end user understands, not in the code, like when you're writing unit tests, the user cannot read the, your unit test and understand it, right? They will test correctness and so on, but it's not something you can use to communicate with the end user. Your integration tests, neither, right? Your end-to-end -end tests, no. It's all code, it's all automation, which is the, removed from what the end user can kind of, like your mom cannot check it, like, oh yeah, you're testing the correct thing, right? But you can have tests which are written in semi-natural language, semi-readable uh, language to, for the end user, and the user can read it and actually agree, like, yeah, that is something I, I want in the app to be, right? And if you can automatically translate that into the test, then that's a win, okay? Of course, it's not possible with like um, in general, but for some subsets, it's, it's possible. Uh, so for some aspects, we can have something which is actually like an acceptance testing framework, which specifies the tests in a, in a format that the end user can understand and agree to. And this format is sort of like a structured user stories. It has certain components, certain preconditions, certain behaviors and certain outcomes that the end user can kind of understand and agree on. Uh, of course, it's a spectrum, right? So if I, if I have a spectrum of frameworks that are really human readable uh, and they are kind of uh, development readable, I have, you know, JUnit here and I have something in like, as you were saying, in a diagramic format or some kind of a, a English prose, like a paragraph describing something. So here, like, we, we see that on this end, we have stuff that we cannot really work with. And on this end, we have stuff that these guys don't understand, right? So something in the middle is something which has both parts. It has kind of as much English as possible and the relationship between the, the components but it has enough structure that we can kind of automate the process. Um, and if you, if you check uh, the karma jasmine uh, pattern, some tests can be written for the end-to-end -end or for integration tests in kind of a format of a mini user stories, right? And then the user can work with it, right? So it, it can use the existing frameworks that we already have but you have to pay attention how do you express the, uh, the behavior and the logic, right? Uh, so for um, both of your projects, it might be good to talk with your product owner and use one of those frameworks to kind of specify, uh, I mean, we, we're trying to do that. We're trying to specify user stories uh, currently as a, as a not logged in user, blah, 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 right? Uh, and then you can translate it into some form of acceptance testing that will be checked automatically, right? It will be part of your CI uh, integration. Uh, so th there are frameworks like that and the whole development is called, you know, behavioral driven development. So the, the idea is that we have, um, um, yeah, we have kind of a, a cycle of interactions between well-defined um, outputs uh, and that it is expressed in a way that the end user can, uh, can agree on. So behavior-driven development is about implementing an application by describing its behavior from the perspective of the stakeholder, which is effectively saying by describing its behavior by user stories, right? Um, because we don't have any other mechanism at the moment to kind of go beyond. We may invent something later, but currently we kind of stuck with that. So even with Karma and Jasmine, even with some end-to-end -end frameworks, you can try to organize your tests in such a way that they express a story, a user story, right? Uh, and then you can have it ticked, right? Can I log in to the system? Yes, you can. The test demonstrates it, right? Can a logged in user do something, open a map? Yes, it can, right? Uh, so you can organize your tests in some sort of a user stories that reflect the functionality that the end user is interested in, right? If you say, uh, can I get a correct hash for my entry into the database? 
the user says, I don't care about any hashes, <laughs> right? But you care as a developer. You need to test it for some functionality that you're working on, right? So the level of testing here is for you. This is for you. This is, you can treat it as it is for the end user, right? Is, is everything that the end user needs able to be done in the system? Uh, is something which we are doing here, the user doesn't want, right? Then it's like, okay, we're doing the wrong thing, right? Why, why we've built it if the user doesn't need that, right? Um, so those tests are kind of more for the user. Those tests are more for you. But of course, it kind of goes from here to here, right? Uh, we cannot spend a lot of time developing something that the user doesn't need, right? So you have to find a balance. How much of the integration testing and end-to-end -end testing you're doing for the acceptance and how much unit testing you're doing. So we have a tendency to do a lot of unit tests and say, yeah, integration later, 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 right? No, you, you should start with the acceptance test today. You should say, what, what is the, what's the product owner wants? What they need? What will be in two weeks time that we can tick and say, yeah, it's done, right? So the second team was spending some time during the retrospective discussing the definition of done and that they have those kind of a multi-stage review process and so on and so forth, which is great. Uh, you need the same for the acceptance from day one. You need to agree with the stakeholders of what they want. So then you can tick it off. You can say, yeah, it's done, right? And prove to them that it's done because you have a test which demonstrates that it's actually working, right? Um, if you don't have that, you may spend time developing something that they don't want or they don't need or that you're doing it wrong, right? Um, so don't, yeah, don't, don't skip it, don't postpone it uh, for later. All right, so that's, that was the uh, long introduction to the acceptance testing. Um, what we can talk a little bit is, um, yeah, so what we have here is, um, yeah, let me just go from the beginning. Yeah, let's go from the start. Why we do testing in general? To have all those uh, all those uh, quality metrics improved, right? But also, um, whether we want it or not, the software often ends up influencing people's lives, right? Um, so I have a couple of examples uh, of systems that caused a lot of damage. Uh, because of software bugs. Uh, so in 2003, there was a blackout. Uh, there was another one later as well, um, which was kind of caused by the software bugs. And you, you measure the costs uh, in billions of dollars, right? So if you say, yeah, we, we have to hurry to develop something and we skip some, some quality checks, because of you know a million dollar savings, sometimes it bites somebody else later, right? Um, and there were uh, fatalities involved as well, so human lives were kind of involved. Um, whoops, um, yeah, that's another one. Um, so for many years, the researchers which were working with the data were ignoring the fact that above um, uh, Antarctica, we have this growing ozone layer hole, right? That there was a, um, there was a problem. They thought it's some sort of um, outlier, right? And they kind of ignored it. So we, we didn't know that we have an ozone layer problem until, you know, uh, many years later when people kind of pay attention. Um, yeah, that one is a famous one as well. Uh, that is uh, an example which we're using for concurrent programming as well. If you entered certain data in a certain time frame, there was a bug. If you did it slower, there was no bug, right? Uh, they, they had race conditions. And if you did, you know, particular keystrokes to enter the, the certain numbers to the machine uh, within a eight seconds, you know, time frame, bad things happened. <laughs> if you didn't, it was fine, right? Um, not, not good. 
So uh, testing in, in general, uh, it's, it's a separate job. Uh, we often do that uh, for improving the quality, for improving the safety of the software, but it's, but it's also part of the, like, the development process. The same way as you have designers, the same way as you have coders, is the same way you have testers. Uh, so why do you think we have like uh, in, in uh, big institutions, we have testers separated from a developer? That the developers are not the ones who are actually testing the software. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah? They have a different, yeah? different point of view. Marcus? Uh, kind of the same thing. You, get, you can get a bit biased when your guy was actually programming the code. So that's right. So that, that happened to me very often um, w that I write tests afterwards uh, and I make the test to pass because I know that the system is working. So I write the test so it passes. Like, I, you know, it's obvious, right? I know the system works. I've tested it manually. So now I don't want to be testing it manually. I write the test by, by automating it. And I'm biased because the test has to pass. If the test doesn't pass, I wrote it wrong, right? Um, and I only write tests that pass. I never write tests which fails because like, come on, the system works, of course it works. Uh, but if the tester writes tests, they don't care, like they don't know how the system is written, how it's supposed to work. They just write tests as they think it should work. And then sometimes it doesn't, the test fails, right? Uh, so they have unbiased perspective on, on how certain things should work. Um, so you can be a full-time tester and in fact uh, there is a shortage of testers. Uh, I'm not sure how, how are the salary comparisons but it fluctuates. Sometimes the testers actually get quite a, a, yeah, comparatively good, good salaries. Um, so um, yeah we have testing and kind of um, a, a, a broader context. So we um, we have different perspectives of, on testing. We have different scope of testing. And then we also have some uh, non-functional uh, requirements, right? So we've discussed this. We, we went from unit testing all the way to acceptance testing. We covered that. Uh, we have white box and black box testing. So this is like, uh, this is not the scope, this is like the particular perspective. What's the difference between white box testing and black box testing? Yeah? In black box testing, you don't know the internal structure of the program, you just test it from the outside without knowing anything, and white box is the opposite, you have full insights. Very good. So you can use both on all those levels, right? You can use white box testing or black box testing on uh, unit tests and integration tests. Um, on the acceptance test level, can you use white box testing? Kind of missing the point that the user doesn't know the structure, doesn't understand it. That's right. Kind of you you technically could, but first of all, it's really hard, and second of all, it would miss the point of the tests, right? So the tests will have to treat the system as a black box. I mean, you don't really need to understand how the system is built to test the, the user stories, right? Um, so we don't do that. But for integration testing and unit testing, you can do both. You can do white box or black box. For unit testing, we often do black box. Uh, we often do white box because we know all the internals, right? Same for, inter for small integration tests. For end-to-end, -end, we tend to just use white box, right? Um, right, so what else, uh, what other non-functional testing can you do? So if we go to the list of eight things, we only have four, but some of them are non-functional, right? Which ones of those eight were functional? So we have Correctness, usability, maintainability, and flexibility. Which ones are functional and which ones are non-functional objectives? Correctness, is it functional or non-functional? Yes, 
functional for sure. Usability. Yeah, in between. Some aspects of it are aesthetics and so on, but some aspects are, you know, it has to do what I want it to do, right? I think it's doing the, the right thing, but in some really tricky way. Exactly. It still works. Exactly. So it's, so it's, it's functional, but it's difficult to use. You could say it's functional, it doesn't really work good for you because it looks bad and it just works bad function isn't good yeah yeah so 50 50 i mean leaning more towards non-functional maybe maintainability non-functional non -functional, for sure flexibility non-functional non um, performance could be in the spec could could be functional could be non-functional more most often it is functional to the level of satisfying right um Testability, non-functional. Reliability, it yeah, it can be functional, right? Uh, it, it often is functional. Uh, how, you know, what, what is the, the, the uh, level of reliability I can expect? And reusability, non-functional. Okay, what other one which we don't have on the list would you consider as a... Uh, requirement which could or may not be functional it's kind of hidden in under the correctness a little bit so, so this one is a little bit overloaded because it says the system satisfies the requirements right um, so it, uh, yeah, Some what, what? Legal issues maybe. Say it again. Some legal issues maybe. Legal, yeah, good, good. What else? Privacy. S privacy and security, right? So um, we don't really have security anywhere here. It, it is hidden under the correctness, right? But in fact, um, I, I've heard a, a good definition uh, that we do software testing uh, for correctness for making sure that the system does what it should do. And we do security testing for checking if the system doesn't do anything else, <laughs> right? Um, so if the user didn't specify something and the system does it, you know, it, it is a security problem, right? But it's not really a correctness problem. The system still does what the user needs. It just do extra things, right? And security checks whether the system doesn't do any extra things. It only does what it should do, right? Uh, so that's why we do security audits and that's why we test for vulnerabilities and for all those extra things, right? All right, so we have those, um, those perspectives um, for non-functional. Non so we have, for example, performance might be non-functional. We can do stress testing, how well the servers can scale. Uh, the user doesn't care. It's the, I mean, it depends, right? Depends who is the, the real user, um, and and so on. Uh, and you will have, you know, security usually here as well. Right. Um, yeah. So you can. Um, uh, we've done that. So. So there are kind of a three, um, uh, yeah, I, I want to, to focus on the, on the last one. So typically what we do, we do tests, like when we write unit tests, we test that the system does what it's supposed to do, right? Um, when you have your test, do you feed like rubbish to it, like for your endpoints? Do you check if the system handles the incorrect things well? You should, right? Sometimes we, we don't do that. And like in the cloud course, a lot of students don't do that at all. Um, so when you feed something which is illegal, they say, yeah, but it wasn't in the spec. Yes, it wasn't in the spec, but you know, how likely is that the user will put something wrong or mistype something, right? 
And then if the system crashes, then you have a problem. The system should never crash. It should handle the erroneous situations which are outside of your control, you know, gracefully, right? So you should provide the appropriate checks and you should provide the appropriate error messages for things which are beyond your control. Of course, if you have a bug and your system crashes because of your bug, that's unavoidable. Like that's what the first two points are about to making sure that you don't have bugs. But making it robust for the user interactions, that's, that's important as well, right? Um, there is this big conflict between uh, uh, formal methods and practical methods, okay? Uh, in formal methods, you can prove that certain behavior is consistent, right? And we do have languages which support it. We have um, some efforts being made in, for example, functional programming, which provide kind of some closed domains and some closed domains modeling, which guarantee that certain properties of the program are maintained, that there are no side effects, there is no vulnerabilities and so on for uh, subsets, right? Every time you go for I.O. or you go for some outside of that kind of... Uh, sandbox environment, of course, bad things may happen, but you've isolated them to separate module. And then you know that this module is guaranteed to have certain properties and you focus on testing and making sure that the other module doesn't do unexpected behaviors. But in programming like Go or Java and so on, we don't have that. We don't have the ability to really use formal methods for real world problems because that's too complex. Um, so. That's why, you know, we, uh, we use testing to provide evidence that there is a bug, not really a proof that there is none, right? So if all your tests pass, it doesn't guarantee that you don't have bugs. You're just minimizing the likelihood that you have bugs, right? You've demonstrated that for all the things that you thought of, you don't have problems, but you still may have problems. Um, all right, so then um, let's, uh, let's have five minutes break um, and we do some simple exercises with, uh, with simple testing, unit testing and integration testing after, after five minutes break. Yeah, this um, exceptions kind of automation that came originally from Ruby. So the, the Ruby community had uh, a language called Cucumber, which looked a little bit like a natural language. Uh, and you could do sort of semi-structured user stories, which became automatically test use cases. Uh, and then other frameworks kind of followed the, the suit. So you can have those verbs uh, like with DDD or Jasmine and so on. There are different frameworks with Jasmine, which have, but Jasmine also has two modes, right? You can do pure unit tests, or you can do this DDD more flavored tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you actually prove to the user that the test is satisfied? So say, um, you say it's a problem here. Yeah. How do you uh, illustrate that it is implemented in the application? Like how do they, do they track it? Or is it just like DDD? Yeah, it's like we do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So it is a bit of a cheat, right? Yeah. Uh, so you specify that this kind of satisfies a particular user story, and then you kind of make the steps which you think satisfy that story, right? Mm. Um, so it, it is a bit of a, yeah, you cannot fully link that, right? No. There is a bit of a leap of faith that you're actually doing that. But yeah. it's better than it, what it used to be, right? Yeah. So it is uh, verbose and trust-based, basically. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it, it kind of works for end-to-end -end tests, uh, because then you try to formulate them as answers to the user stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you usually um, write up all, those, or all the cases before you start? So say you have a set of uh, functionality you want in your application. 
We like that DVD for everyone, but you say that some of them are not satisfied right from the get go. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. how we should do. Yes, because that becomes a spec. Yeah. Right? That becomes a specification for what you're aiming at. And that drives the rest. That drives all your unit tests and integration tests and so on. You, at the end of the day, you want those tests to be satisfied. Yeah. Right? And then you can basically wrap it and say that, for example, one passes and the rest fails, and then that is your kind of assigning progress. Exactly, yes, exactly. Okay. So in a, in a way, in an ideal situation, what you would have, you would have a backlog of those tests, and then after each sprint, some of them will become satisfied. Yeah. But then after the next sprint, you will satisfy more, but don't break the existing ones, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, as much about backward, about Compatibility as the rest. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then if the user changes mind and some of those backlogs user stories change, that influences everything else, yeah. right? Yeah. So if there is a change in requirements or something, then you kind of drive it from the user end. Yeah. That's what those agile methods are about. Mm -hmm. So agile methods are all about keeping user in the loop mm -hmm. and having them kind of being a feedback after each sprint to kind of uh, demo what you have, right? So if you, for example, right now kind of demo to the system and the UI and the user says, mm, yeah, like we don't need login, like wh why would we have login? Then you don't have it, right? You don't have that functionality. Yeah. Yeah. It would be kind of interesting to combine it with like extreme programs where you actually yes. program more than the user expects ahead of time. Yes. So, yeah. So like an ideal methodology would be then to write behavioral test and then drive, uh, write or do test during development. That's right. Like that. But it, it uh, adds a lot of abstraction to the whole like architecture and testing and developing are separate uh, separate jobs basically. Mm -hmm. So like it, for a small team it's a lot of overhead in my view. So it like is. in a bigger team it, could, it makes it easier to yeah, have everything. Yeah, that's right. But even in a small team, like I, it still is a little bit cumbersome because, for example, um, so let's say you do have the, the story, right? You have a story that the user should log in, right? Uh, yeah, login is not a good one. Uh, but imagine that it's something other than login. And then you have to get the UI and you have to get the flow of what the user actually needs, right? And that has to be done first. So you cannot have a sprint which involves the designers and interaction designers and programmers in the same sprint. No. So you have to split it, right? So the designers are doing it in one sprint, and then they're moving to the next task they have on the list, while you, as developers, take that and take the UI elements and so on, and you work on it in the next sprint, right? But then you cannot really demonstrate it to the user in the, after the first one. No. So then there is a bit of a delay before the cycle finishes. Yeah. And the, Design team and the development team are out of sync, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's like in uh, Agile, uh, everyone or basically all of the operations should happen simultaneously. Yes. Somewhat. Exactly. And, and uh, especially for projects which uh, has a backend and frontend and a design phase and everything, yeah. it's hard to just like go because uh, yeah. Uh, Sometimes you need time to step back and have some discussions and everything, and everyone has started at the same time or one week apart. Yeah. It's hard to keep everything, in, everyone in the loop. Yes. I think. But it's like, yeah, the IT is very good, and almost every team uses like that, some um, method of agile. But yeah, something is a bit iffy sometimes. That's right. And especially if you have poorly written specifications or something, or if you have a very loose, uh, or the task itself is very loose with the project owners, yeah. it leaves a lot of room for mistakes or misunderstandings. That's and right. Use, and it costs a lot of money. Yes. That's why you want the sprints to be relatively short, and that's why you want the loop. So if you spend a week on something that the product owner doesn't really need, Okay, it's one week lost, but you know, no big deal. You don't want to spend months, right? Yeah. So then those, those cycles and the kind of show and tell sessions are to correct the course. Yeah, and it's more uh, the more I uh, 
think about these kind of issues, the more I understand why you should have data in the same retrospective. Yes, basically. Yeah. Because it is a way of keeping everyone in the loop and having a continuous agreement on everything. Definitely. So yes. it's like when Tom first uh, presented like, yeah. 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 like this is all over. But yeah. the more I go into these kind of issues, the more I understand the kind of things you need. To exactly. Yeah. And the smaller the team, the less you need that. Because yeah. by nature of the small team, you're kind of on the same page. Yeah, like, right? But the bigger the team, the more you really need it. Yeah. Uh, and then there is a limit. That's why the agile teams don't exceed, let's say, 10 people or something like this. Because then you you have... Yeah, then you have the same problem again. Exactly. You can't it. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, so... Um, Let's continue. Uh, there is one, uh, because uh, if you go to the, if you go to the um, seminar, uh, there are two slide decks. Uh, one is that I'm using, but it's kind of, I'm, I'm jumping through it. So you can kind of use it as a refresher for some of the concepts. This one is uh, about testing strategies. So you should have, at the beginning of the project, kind of uh, address some of the strategies that you're gonna use and for what purpose, right? Uh, we haven't stressed it yet, so I'm, I'm kind of stressing it now, that from the next retrospective, you should kind of talk a little bit about the quality, I mean, you, you did already, but talk more about the quality assurance and how you, what you're measuring and how you're measuring it, right? Uh, and how you're improving the quality. And then there is a tutorial which I did two years ago, so it's with Angular 2, I think, uh, and Karma and Jasmine. Uh, conceptually, it's the same. What changed is some of the, you know, framework, um, installation and so on. So you can have a look at that as well. Um, I don't have time today to dive into the new framework and uh, um, I was planning to do some demonstrations with Go, but uh, the Go team already have the, they did the cloud course and they know how to do testing. It's part of the part of the language. With Java, I'm sure you're using JUnit. Uh, no, no big deal. Um, have a look into the acceptance testing frameworks and try to use them. Try to specify some of the user stories early, so then you know it kind of becomes your your spec. Um, so those are the materials for the for the course. Um, where is the, okay. Um, so I lost the window with the slides. Okay, let's open it again. Um, so one thing that I want to, um, um, yeah. So you can do testing manually, but it's tedious. And you're doing it, but it takes time and it takes energy, right? Uh, you should automate as much as possible. So how can you automate the testing? Uh, by writing tests, right? Uh, one of, in one of those levels. Uh, the other way you're improving quality is by doing code reviews. Uh, the code reviews are very good and you cannot really automate that. You have to, you can use a tool which helps but somebody has to look through the code, right? Uh, why do we do code reviews? Yeah, why, what else? Ensure group agreed quality, so like you have uh, a second person reviewing that it is up to the team standard. Yeah. But so we somebody with the same knowledge or, the, or expertise in the language uh, should understand it easily what you wrote. Yeah. So it's kind of what, what he said also that <laughs> it's like you're trying to maintain a consistent level of quality within the team, right? Uh, so people understand the code. And people can uh, agree that yeah, it's it's of good quality. So of course, there is additional reason. The additional reason is that 
if you wrote a, a piece of code which does certain functionality, uh, you know how it works. You know how it is structured because you've wrote it, right? But nobody else knows it, right? Um, and then if the second person looks at the code, now there are two people who understand that, that piece of functionality, right? So when it comes to main, maintaining the code or when it comes to extending the code or changing it or you know, complying with some of the APIs, now you have two people who can do that, right? Not just one. Uh, so it's a mechanism for sharing know-how within the team, for learning each other about certain patterns and about how things are done. So then if one person is sick, another person can kind of uh, fit, fit in into the role and maintain it and fix it or help with the, with the tasks that are required. If that was not happening, then one person becomes sort of uh, tied to a, a code, code base, and then if that person is sick or missing, then suddenly the, there is nobody who can you know, easily maintain it. You have to spend time learning of how things are done. And maybe then you say, yeah, it's a little bit iffy. It should be done slightly differently. But then it's like too late, right? It's already been used all over the place. And then it's really difficult to change it. So if this mechanism happens earlier, you have less technical debt and you have redundancy in your team. Um, so code reviews are expensive because, you know, another person spends time checking the code. But in the long term, they are beneficial for the, for the team. Um, so you can do inspection review. Um, right. Um, you can do functional testing, right? We discussed that. Um, and you can do equivalence testing. Um, so this is a form of testing which, uh, so typically when you write tests, you have to identify some test cases, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, it's best to do it on the example. Um, so, Assume that you have written an application that the instructor can use to enter student marks. Each student mark is within the range from 0 to 100. How would you prepare testing this? How would you test that the function actually correctly works? What sort of user test would you write or unit test? one for each range that it fits the correct answer with the correct range talk. Yeah. And I will give five cases that it fits into one of them. And some, uh, probably some negative number, number over 100, and maybe not in degree two. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's say uh, if I test for the app with minus two, and it says, no, you cannot enter minus two. It's out of range. And then I test it with minus five. And then I test it with minus 10. Do I have to repeat multiple tests like this? I, I shouldn't, right? So if it works for one negative number and it catches it and says, OK, it's wrong, I call it an equivalent class. It doesn't matter if I have just one test or million tests. It, it, just tells me that, OK, it's very likely that your program will deal with the negative numbers right, OK? Uh, can I test all negative numbers? I never can test all possible negative numbers, right? Um, so, you know, picking one or two out of the possible set is fine, and that's it, right? That's a satisfying effort. But will it work for? 0 to 100, I don't know. If I only have tested this, I don't know, right? So the other was uh, numbers from 0 to 100, right? Um, how many should I pick from this range? Yeah? Probably a maximum. Probably a minimum. Probably a maximum. Probably something in the middle. Just in case that the minimum and maximum are handled in some you know unusual way and everything in, in the middle is handled separately. So three, right? Three would probably be fine, right? Uh, should I test all of them? Probably not. Uh, yeah. 
that you should test floating points. That's right. So that's another one, right? So another one is over 100, which is similar to this equivalence class. And another case is, you know, uh, floats. What, what happens if um, an instructor says five in text in English? F-I-V-E. Five. So string, right? No. Or name. Now, undefined. Yeah. So we have some, some, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so here we have. It's not really an equivalence class. It's kind of additional test that we might have for kind of uh, erroneous situations. And then we have one equivalence class, another one, and another one, right? Uh, with with this one being kind of uh, split into the three chunks, right? So equivalence testing is thinking about the problem and trying to group the tests in kind of an equivalence class, which means increasing the number of tests in that equivalence group doesn't really increases my quality of testing. But increasing the number of groups increases my level of testing, right? So increasing testing more negative numbers doesn't make my, uh, co my testing better, but increasing the number of unusual situations makes it better, right? Each of this is its own equivalence class because I'm saying floats, like different floats, right? I just need one to test, but it kind of tests the float. So this is an equivalence class. Strings, that's an equivalence class. And the kind of undefined null, uh, yeah, I, I probably should have undefined and null separate, right? Um, if, if it's JavaScript. <clears throat> Okay, so you, you, you got the gist, right? Uh, so equivalence testing is um, a, a mechanism for um, structuring your test. Another one is, um, we've, already, we've already discussed it here, is the kind of edge conditions. So if you have some ranges, usually you try to identify what are kind of the transitions between one equivalence group and the other. Is there a, like a single element which transits and then we, we should test that as a special case. Um, so there are some, um, yeah, some um, examples in the, in the slides. You can check them. Uh, we've discussed this already as well. So we said, OK, uh, we have unit tests, which are the kind of a common testing. We test them in isolation. We do mocking, module testing. So we test combined functionality. We again do some mocking and then you do more and more components together. So you have subsystem testing and system testing, and then at the end you test end to end and you know try to make it as acceptance tests. So we've discussed that. Um, yeah, we've discussed unit testing, integration testing, um, and then with integration testing you have different mechanisms. So you can do it, it depends how you structure your tests uh, regarding the modules that you're testing uh, and what you're mocking, right? Uh, so there are like top-down integration tests where you mock, you know, you test A, but you mock the, the rest, or you could have bottom-up. So you test the bottom subsystems, but you mock the behavior of the higher level subsystems, right? Um, so those are kind of a mechanics of the, of the testing. Uh, then the, you have the system testing. So you have some objectives, you know, installation deployment, security, uh, stress testing, and so on. Uh, and at the end, you have the acceptance tests. Um, you can do security testing um, on all those levels. You don't do security testing only on the system level. You can do it on the level of units as well sometimes. Um, it's quite cool because Go uh, includes now uh, a simple but quite, uh, quite working security checks um, in the Metalinter. So if you, if you installed a Metalinter and installed a security sub-module for it, 
it will check for common patterns that you're doing uh, that may leak may lead to some security problems. So, for example, if you're opening a server on all the interfaces in in the in the code in the source code, it will tell you why you're opening the network connection on all the interfaces that you have. It's a vulnerability potentially, right? Uh, so it picks up little things, or if you have like a password hard coded somewhere in the um, in the code. It does semantic analysis of, of your variables and how they are passed and where they are passed to. And it has mechanisms to understand that that password is actually hard coded in your source code, right? Um, so it does some, some of those things for you. Um, yes, we talked a little bit about uh, extreme programming. So you can check it, check it out. Testing with genuinity we've done. Um, all right, so I will skip that. I will skip that. Um, what I, yes. So what I want to finish with is the test-driven development. Um, so classical testing is done that you design a system, you code it, and then you write tests. That's what I said. And most of us do that, right? You brainstorm, you discuss what functionality is needed, you write it, you test it with hand, you know, one time, 10 times, 20 times, you get sick of it. And then you say, crap, I'm going to automate this test. And then you write the test, which tests exactly what you've been manually testing, that it works. It shows you that it works, and you're done, right? And then instead of re running the program and clicking through or putting the entry and so on and testing that it works, you have your test. You run the testing framework, and it's done, right? Um, in test-driven de de development, uh, you write tests before you write your code, right? The tests are driving you writing code, not other way around. Uh, so you start by a design, of course, by deciding what, need, what you need to do, what you need to uh, code. But then instead of writing a code, you're writing a test first, right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever wrote tests for something that you don't have yet? And what are the benefits of doing that? Yeah? You kind of uh, put your expected behavior into uh, formalize your expectation, uh, expectations of the code mm -hmm. before you actually write the code. Yeah. So you could say, I want to have like a method for doing this, and it should fail on this and pass on this, and then you can write the method. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, my, my experience was the same. I quite like the feel of how it will work once it's implemented, so I can kind of uh, try it out before I code it. So I can write the API and the mechanism for calling things and for how things are named before I implement it, right? And it's very easy because it doesn't work yet. It's like I can write anything, right? I'm free to choose how I feel to interact with some component uh, because it's not there yet. Uh, but once I do that, it becomes like a spec to, for which I have to implement the, the actual thing. Uh, and then I know what to do, right? Uh, so I, I, quite, um, I quite like that, that aspect. What else? What else is beneficial of writing tests first? Yeah. Like you said before, that uh, if you write the test afterwards, then you test the, when you write a test that passes. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And you don't have this uh, this uh, kind of uh, limitation in the beginning. You just write whatever it came to your mind. That's right. So, so you're not biased. And then you write code which passes instead of writing test, test which that. passes, right? That's that's exactly what it is, right? So um, so it's kind of a test first approach, um, and um, it follows a kind of a simple algorithm that you uh, you write test, write a test which uh, which failed. Uh, so then you have to. So you add a test, and then you run the test, and it fails. So you have to make your changes, and you have to run the test again. And if it passes, you add the test. And then if you run the test and it passes, you do the test. So you keep adding tests until they fail. 
and then you write code when the tests fail, right? When the tests fail, you write code, you rerun the, um, the tests, and you, you code until your existing tests pass. And when the existing tests pass, you write more tests, right? Um, strictly speaking, I mean, you can add more tests while you're writing code as well, but that's sort of the idiomatic way of doing uh, test-driven development. Um, so advantages. The API usually tends to be better designed because you're not writing it in isolation. Uh, you're writing it from the point of view of the user, right? So let's say you're writing a library for access to the database, and then what do you need? Oh, you need some initialization, you need some uh, adding stuff, getting stuff out, counting things, and so on, right? So you, you de de design all those methods, and the names are kind of long or whatever, because you don't care, like you can design whatever you like. And then you pass this library to a developer who needs to use it, which often is yourself. And then you say, db dot initialize and so on, and you feel ah, oh, it's too long. I it should have been called init, right? It, like when you start using it, you see all the deficiencies of the design. So it's good if you start from using it, and then you see okay, um, it's it should be this. It should be named this because it it makes it more consistent with what I've been using before or whatever, right? So for example, in Java, for the <laughs> size of the containers, if they did TDD some of the mistakes they've done for how many things are in particular container would be more consistent because it's obvious when, you, when you're doing it that it should be called size or get size consistently, right? Um, all right, uh, so um, the API, it's testable. So one of the, uh, we, we only have four, but you remember the eight? One of them was testability, right? Uh, your API will be, your implementation will be more testable because you are writing tests. So you have to have access to the API that you need to test, right? So by definition, your APIs will be test friendly because you've developed them with tests already in place. What happens often is you write your code, you want to write a unit test, and now you kind of, oh, this method is pr private or protected. I, I don't have access to it, right? Uh, so then you have to redesign the access and so on to make it testable, right? Or you, you wrote a simple test, and now you go to integration test, and you say, oh, crap, I need to mock this thing, and I cannot mock it because it's hard-coded in the other module. I have no access to it. It's private, right? How can I mock it? Then you can't, right? You have to redesign everything. So if you start with tests and you know I'm testing this and I need to mock that, you know that you have to make it mockable. You have to make it kind of pluggable that your design and your implementation allows that, right? So by definition of doing tests first, you have those two um, points covered. Uh, you have test coverage because obviously you, you're coding for the tests. So you, you don't care about test coverage because by definition, you have like 100% because your implementations are always for the tests. Um, and testing becomes the specification. That's what you said. Testing becomes, you know, a kind of a definition of what needs to be done. Failing tests are good because they tell you what's next to do, right? Uh, so they become kind of a documentation. Uh, so then, again, I had an example here, which I will not do. Um, so uh, we're getting kind of towards the end. Uh, so I will um, post a short video on uh, TDD from the perspective of a person who doesn't buy in any of those arguments, okay? So he kind of talks about TDD from a practical point of view, and he kind of stresses what we were discussing, that he likes the, the notion of a spec. He likes the kind of a, a notion of a, what, what to do next. Okay, uh, which kind of reminds me, uh, when you're coding, uh, you have a keyboard and a screen and you're kind of doing your, your work, right? Do you have a piece of paper and a pen next to you as well? How many of you use a piece of paper and pen next to you? Why? So why Marcus and Thomas are using it? Uh, because sometimes it's easier to just sketch out the problem than 
keeping with code and trying to get it to work. So yeah. uh, it's a way for me to step back and see the logic. Yeah. Sometimes. And help with thinking. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Uh, usual, I see it uh, somehow graphically mm -hmm. the problem or uh, testing out uh, like this test ranges and equivalents, for example, that I will take, this will go here, this will go here, yeah. to make some kind of the sequences, a kind of the, kind of the crap UML, you can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I do the same. So I'm kind of a visual thinker. I like to draw and kind of uh, organize my, my ideas like on a piece of paper, which I have really hard time doing on the screen. That's one reason, so it's the same as, as yours. And the second reason is I really like to, um, to write on a piece of paper if I'm switching context. So let's say I'm, uh, I'm coding a particular function and then I've noticed that I have to refactor something somewhere else. So I kind of put a mental note that I need to refactor the other thing after I'm done here. So it's like my to-do list, like very micro to-do list for things that I would forget if I don't write it down. So if I, uh, well, like in the mid middle of the writing a function and I have this thought about doing this refactoring, so I will write refactor the other thing on the piece of paper and then keep going with my thinking. So I don't need to think about the other thing. It's, it's on the piece of paper, so it clears my head. And then it sort of is a, a way of structuring my to-do list, right? It, it kind of gives me a context of what to do next. And also when I'm in the middle of something and someone comes, I write, I, I kind of write where, where I was <laughs> mentally. And then I deal with something and come back. And from this piece of paper, I know where to jump, like exactly. So it's sort of my uh, mental scrapbook or cache where I keep my mental state as much as I can. Um, and TDD kind of helps with that as well, because this guy talks about it. He, he talks about it becomes kind of like your to-do list, like you know, you know what to do next. Um, and I, I quite like that as well. So what I will do, I will put that onto the, um, onto the Confluence Wiki. You can have a, a watch, it's like five minutes video, so it's easy to, um, to check. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, 11 o'clock, we're finishing on time. I was a bit sketchy about the slides, but they are organized, so you can uh, go through the slides if you want, in order. Um, okay. Any questions? Oh yeah, okay, so let's do that.